Speaking of shows, you actually took Kid Rock on his first tour. Years later, well, Easy E took me on my first tour. Right. First and foremost. Right. And people watched the movie. I know a lot of people that went on that tour, and a lot of people that were around at that time. And like, people don't really say, "Man, it didn't happen like that." Like they don't really get off into all that, but they they say a, a whole lot more happened that day, or happened right when that happened. It was a whole lot more to it. But you gotta a movie can't tell that whole fucking. Right. You know, you gotta tell a good story, a great story. You can't tell every fucking detail. So I would watch the movie. I've seen it probably like a handful of times, and a lot of that shit coincided with places I was at and things I was doing and I, you know I was very close to that shit mm -hmm. and you know uh, Easy e brought me in called me and you know he's like you want to go on tour and I'm like yeah shit cause they had boys in, boys in the hood are always oh, hard yeah. and that was hot and I had these are the tales the, the freaky, freaky tales, tales. <laughs> so then I dropped Life is Too Short and my album came out the gate I had never been anything except local. Born and Mac was picked up by Jive. Born and Mac came before Life is Too Short. It was picked up by Jive and sold a few hundred thousand copies. It didn't even go go right out the gate. But Life is Too Short was the first album that I recorded and released with Jive. Mm -hmm. I dropped that. It goes 300,000 copies out the gate. Like I remember seeing a, a promo thing they had, Life is Too Short. 300,000 copies in three weeks. And that was like a big deal. Mm -hmm. I'm like, damn, out the gate, 300,000 copies. So Easy got it. I mean, they had just dropped um, Straight Outta Compton album. And that motherfucker was doing better than my shit. It was out there. And Easy called me. He's like, you want to go on tour? And it was like, you know, it was like a no-brainer. Like, we was the hottest shit moving up and down the coast. Like, let's go. I was like probably the greatest supporting act you could fucking <laughs> get at shit because... I was seasoned, like that was my first tour, but I was seasoned on stage. Right. I was, I was, I knew how to work the fuck out of crowd. When I went on my first tour, I was, I, it was no learning curve. I was already there. Okay. So, um, um, were you go, nervous? That's a lot of people. Nope. I used to have this little weak ass, um, intro that everything about me has always been like, like it don't need no flair. Okay. No glitter, no. Diamonds, no nothing. So I just had this box. They can't see this, but it kind of looked like the light you got right there. Okay. So it's the box with the light shining from the back. So you're inside the box, and all you see is a silhouette. It's a simple ass stage intro that people have used in many different aspects from mm -hmm. fucking Cirque du Soleil to everything. It's the silhouette box. So it's my first tour. I'm sitting, I'm standing there in the box, and the, the white curtain comes up. You see my shadow and the curtain comes up and it's really me. And that was my one effect. All I had was like some dollar signs, some dogs, or some, you know, dog, my microphones and a dog. But I was hella, hella basic. But for people to see Too Short for the first time, the motherfucker was going crazy, crazy. Easy e took us NWA. We went around to all the arenas. That was my first taste of it. Later on, uh, right after that, Ice Cube quit the group and Ice Cube went solo. He did the album with um, America's Most Wanted. And we was homies. Ice Cube was my homie. And we got in touch with each other. It's like, you know, I don't know whose idea it was or who made I don't know. We just went on a, a, a tour as co-headliners where a lot of nights he closed the show. A lot of nights I closed the show. We had a really big song together. It was uh, a bitch ain't nothing but a word to me. Mm -hmm. Bitch ain't nothing but a word. We would do that song together. Crowd go crazy. Like, we, we you know... Uh, I was told that you could bring one group. Ice Cube brought Yo-Yo. Okay. Because that was his artist. Yeah. And I was like, you know, Kid Rock was my homie, so I brought Kid Rock. Oh, okay. Interesting. I was like, I, I put him on the tour, and I knew, he, right. I knew he would make the most of it, and out of anybody I knew at the time, like, he was the person I felt earned, deserved the slot. Crazy. And I really, to this day, believe it was a good decision because it probably helped him a lot with his development on stage. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a... It's great to know how big he became mm -hmm. and that I was able to throw an assist at a young age. Totally. And then, uh, you know, D-Nice was on that stage. D-Nice, the DJ. D-Nice was on that tour. He, um... Oh, wow. Because he had a the song. They call me D-Nice. Uh -huh. He had that song out, so... And it's good to see D-Nice, like, you know, balling like he is right now. 
And this whole entertainment thing is a fraternity. It's a family. Right. And so many, on so many levels and so many different eras and places and times and years, too short is family. <laughs> and that's what that whole list is about. Like For you, sure. you get that part of it, but you might... Like too short, like my uncle short, but you might have fucking forgot what uncle short did. Yeah. You might have fucking forgot the journey and the ride that I just had along the way. And we in, we in the kind of industry hip hop where every little, every so often, like some people do it very often, but you got to keep reminding motherfuckers in hip hop, like, you know what the fuck I am, right? You know, I don't got to beat it down. You, you beat you up with it all the time, but you got to remind these motherfuckers every now and then. Like if I wouldn't, if I would have never made Blow the Whistle, it could be a debate right now today. Like, who, who came up with the word bitch? Yeah. Like, people would debate the shit. Blow the Whistle was, at that time, it was like the story was branching out of the origin of bitch. And I was like, nah, y'all ain't, y'all ain't finna take that from me. Is it crazy to you that Blow the Whistle still hits every time it plays? Is Little that- John made the beat. I know. All right. I wrote the lyrics. <laughs> It's not much to the song except the beat and the lyrics. Right. And neither one of us knew that that song would do what it did. And to this day, it's probably the one thing we always mention something of it because it gets sampled a lot. For sure. It do- it has many, many like viral clips. Oh, yeah, Sweetie sampled it. I mean, it has all these viral clips and weird stories around the world of what Blow the Whistle did. And every time... Me and Lil John see each other. We had we we got a cool little relationship. Right. But that's probably the one thing we mentioned something blow the whi- blow the whistle ish <laughs> every time we see each other. Man, blow the whistle still. Man, can you believe? Can right. you believe? Like it was 15 years and we like, like, can you believe it? For sure. It's How still was going? it taking Lil John on the on tour? Um, well, Lil John was in the music industry. He was a successful local DJ. And he was doing production for So So Def, uh, So So Def Bass All Stars. And he had a job at So So Def. He was A and R, so he was oh, yeah. he had an office. He was there. Right. He was Jermaine's guy in the industry. People knew him, Little John. And he made this record. Who you with, Kid Crunk? Who you with? To the flow, to the flow. You go back. You do the research. <laughs> <laughs> so that song later became um, Duro. Uh, oh wow! And what's that candy paint song? Whatever yeah, that song yeah, is? yeah, yeah. Crazy. That's the same beat. Wow! Ice cream paint job. That's on that beat. Lil John had that out years before that, and it was it was hot. It was hot all around the what do you call that? The southeast region. Mm-hmm. He was hot, and I told Lil John I was like I didn't even know him, but I knew him as a DJ, and I always always admired his DJ skills because DJs play songs, and they be like. So and so in the house or whatever, right? But Little John would DJ and he would be saying stuff. And it would be sort of a call and response and just all kind of shit. But he knew how to say stuff. And his DJing was like an artist doing the show. Mm. Like he was rocking the crowd. And I was like a Little John fan before he was famous. He was a local DJ. He had that one song. And I knew who the fuck he was. I was a fucking fan. <laughs> and I always was like, I hear that song on the radio, and I was like, that's crazy, and nobody rapped on this song. It's just them talking and chanting and making noise. And I was like, bro, let's do a remix. First time I ever approached him. I was like, let's do a remix with me rapping on there. Mm. He was like, nah, that's old, man. Let's do something new. I was like, all right, let's do something new. And he came to my studio. I had a fly ass studio in Atlanta, my first location. And... I wasn't there when he came there and, you know, whatever, I hooked it up. So, you know, they let him in the studio and he stayed there. I don't know how long, but he left a couple of beats. And this one beat he left was, uh, it's called Couldn't Be a Better Player. Well, I named it Couldn't Be a Better Player. I don't know what the fuck his original version of his mind would have been, but it had a hook. What the fuck you going to do? Hey, what? What the fuck you going to do? What you going to do? And they had a little intro. Us niggas in the shop be representing the shit and try to keep a player hit us up out there because he's busting anything like acting rude, whatever the fuck it was. So the, he had the intro, he had the hook. And I like added another hook and put three fucking 16 bar verses, which made it a song that was damn near six minutes long. Mm-hmm. But we had this song, it's called Couldn't Be a Better Player. 
You couldn't be a better player than me. Even if you fucked every day of the week. I know you think you got it like that, but peep, I be fucking hoes every day of the week. Like, that shit was hot. I love like, it. Like, from what he did on Who You With to that, I mean, it was like, if you was of age in Atlanta that year, which would have been 96, 97, I don't know what fucking year it was, 97, something like that, I don't know, 90, I don't know, I don't know what year it was. But if you was there, that was just shit. Right. Period. And after that, we did be a bitch. You know what I'm saying? So I remember Be a Beer was a song called You Just a Bitch. And it was the same music. Dun, 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 dun. You, know, you know the beat? How the fucking beat go? <laughs> but it was the same beat. And Instead of going, be a bitch, the hook was, you just a bitch, you punk ass bitch, you ain't nothing but a bitch. And he had a, he had a, a that was on the B side. It was a single. On the A side, it was, um, I like them girls. It was like an up tempo dance kind of the vibe he did with the uh, So So Deaf yeah. All Stars. So I like them girls was a single. And he hit me up one day or seen me somewhere one day or something. He's like, man, the B side is moving. Like, he like the A side had a video. You know, the video was hot. He was out there. He said the B side is moving. <laughs> so he had to figure out a way to make the B side a clean version. And he came up with that B A B A, did a remix, added Ludacris, song became a big hit. But there's a whole nother version called Just a Bitch. You just a bitch. Crazy. Crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Facts, motherfucker. Facts. <laughs> I could run this shit all day. You mentioned the NWA tour. Uh, what do you think of the conspiracy theories around Easy E's death? Um, well, you know, I said this shit early on. And the more years went by and the more knowledge that came out about HIV and AIDS, it still seems a little out of place to me that even the way they portrayed it in the movie, even the way I remember it happening in real life, you know, Easy like, in a nutshell, I can say it really fast. He was like, <clears throat> my chest hurt, and then fucking died of AIDS. You know what I mean? And it's like, what happened to HIV? What happened to actually, you know, having AIDS and then deteriorating? Like, you just, oh, doc, my chest hurt, and then you died. Like, something fucking happened. Like, mm -hmm. something happened. Something other happened. I don't know what. I could never even pinpoint what it might be. Right. But I know. It wasn't fucking HIV AIDS. Like he didn't, cause at that time, not enough people in our community, nobody had really the knowledge of what that is. So it was kind of story that kind of like, damn, the easy, they fucked a bunch of bitches and died of AIDS, you know? But everybody that I knew since then that contracted HIV and then had AIDS, it was a, they died, it was a long death. It wasn't my chest hurting and coma then dead. It wasn't, wasn't that so. You know, and then right off the rip, we kept waiting on, well, who else had it? Nobody else had it. No baby mamas, no girlfriends, nobody had it. That's crazy. So you just, you just fucked some random bitch one night that gave you the AIDS and everybody else, you never fucked me. I don't, it just seemed very. Right. I'm not the only person who feels like this. 